I believe in miracles because I believe in God. This is the message this ministry is taking to the world through signs, wonders, miracles, and healings. You are responsible before God for today. God wants to show His power and His greatness in our lives. And I'd like to wish a happy Easter to all of our viewers today. Welcome to the Ernest Angley Hour. I'm Reverend Chris Mockamer. I'll be your host for this Sunday program. We have good Easter songs for you today. Also, a sermon that I preach that I pray will help you in difficult times and situations in your life. And we also have special things in store for you that I know will bless you in a great way. But first, it's the singing gospels. Their song is, The Sun Has Risen. The sun has risen, hallelujah, the stone is rolled away. The sun has risen, glory, glory, rejoice in love and praise. The sun has risen, what power, our voices shout and sing. The sun has risen, hallelujah, Jesus Christ our King. At the old rugged cross, the crowd was standing in awe. Carrying the sins of many, he gave his life for all. No tomb will hold our Savior, no death will keep him there. He'll rise on the third day, all heaven is prepared. The sun has risen, hallelujah, the stone is rolled away. The sun has risen, glory, glory, rejoice in love and praise. The sun has risen, what power, our voices shout and sing. The sun has risen, hallelujah, Jesus Christ our King. The sun has risen, hallelujah, from the grave with victory. We're giving the praise to heaven, from sin we're set free. Risen, hallelujah, the stone is rolled away. The sun has risen, glory, glory, rejoice in love and praise. The sun has risen, what power, our voices shout and sing. The sun has risen, hallelujah, Jesus Christ our King. The sun has risen, hallelujah, the stone is rolled away. The sun has risen, glory, glory, rejoice in love and praise. The sun has risen, what power, our voices shout and sing. The sun has risen, hallelujah, Jesus Christ our King. The sun has risen, hallelujah, the sun has risen, hallelujah, the sun has risen, hallelujah, Jesus Christ our King. Jesus Christ our King, our King, our King. He walked out of the tomb for you and me. He walked out with a shout of victory. He walked out. He walked out. He walked out. He walked out of the tomb that day. Brought us a glorious resurrection day. He walked out. He walked out. He walked out. He walked out of the tomb for you and me. He walked out with a shout of victory. He walked out. He walked out. He walked out. The greatest event of all time, the resurrection of Jesus for mankind. He walked out of the tomb that day, conquered death, hell, and the grave. He walked out, praise God, he walked out. He walked out he of the tomb that out. day, brought us a glorious, glorious resurrection day. day. He walked out, he praise walked God, out. he walked out. He walked out, he walked out of the tomb for you and me. He walked out with a shout of victory. He walked out. He walked out, he walked out. The message of the tomb will never die. He's building us a home beyond the sky. We will live as the ages roll. No sickness or death will never know. He walked out, praise God, he walked out. 
now. He walked out of the tomb that day, he brought us a glorious resurrection day. He walked out, praise God, he walked out. He walked out of the tomb for you and me. He walked out with a shout of victory. He walked out, he walked out, he walked out. Sound the bells of heaven, let angels sing. The empty tomb message declares Christ King. Oh, come to the living waters of life. Took from the prophet. He walked out, praise God, he walked out. He walked out, he walked out, he brought us a glorious resurrection day. He walked out, praise God, he walked out. He walked out, walked out for you and me. He walked out with a shout of victory. He walked out, he walked out, he walked out. He walked out on the turn of that day, brought us a glorious resurrection day. title for the sermon tonight is what to do when you don't know what to do. Now this sermon is an important lesson for every child of God to learn. It's a lesson simple to understand. However, over the years, it's been very difficult to put into practice for many Christians. And the theme of this sermon is trust and patience. Trust and patience. And a lot of people, even Christians, they have a difficult time with these. Trust and patience. They work well together. They complement one another. However, if you lack one, you're going to lack the other. If a person does not trust someone else, they're not going to have very much patience with them. And I want to take you to Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Now people will say they desire God's direction for their life, but then they struggle to receive it. Many times it's due to a lack of trust. And a lack of trust will result in a lack of patience. Not waiting upon the Lord to receive that direction they so desperately need. God's direction for your life will be made manifest to you as you learn to trust him with your whole heart, regardless of the circumstances you face. He will direct your life when you decide you will forsake your own understanding and put trust in him. However, if you're going to lean to your own understanding, your own wisdom, your own knowledge, that means you're not trusting God with all of your heart. Oh, you may trust him part of the time, most of the time, but not with all of your heart. You're not. In patience, what a virtue to patiently wait upon the Lord and acknowledge him in all your ways. This makes plain paths for a child of God's feet. Always remember God is not a man, and that means his ways are not human ways, his thoughts are not human thoughts. He does not move like a man, he does not think like a man. In God's will many times, and I said in God's will, in God's will, you will face circumstances and not know what God wants or how he's going to move. And this is why to please God and receive from him requires patience. Learning to wait upon the Lord. 
One of Reverend Angie's favorite scriptures over the years, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. You won't crumble and grow weak under extreme circumstances you're facing as you wait upon the Lord. No, your, your strength will be renewed waiting. But then they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. It is necessary to understand in the divine will of God, O oh child of God, you will be tried and tested. It will happen throughout your life. No matter how close to God you get, you will be tried and tested. And the word of God bears it out. God will test your love. He will test your faith. He will test your obedience. Why? Because he seeks to work patience in you. Patience does not come easy. And these tests and trials, they come. But how do they come? They come in the form of tribulation. Romans chapter 5, verse 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Paul understood this. It was a revelation from the Holy Ghost. So he knew the need of patience. He knew God sought to work patience in him, to teach him to trust in the Lord and wait upon him. So he embraced the tribulation. He gloried in the tribulation. Not because he thought he was doing something wrong, but because he knew he was in the will of God and good was coming from it. He was receiving patience. Patience is so important. Patience is so valuable. This is what God thinks of patience. Luke 21, 19, Jesus said, In your patience possess ye your soul. So patience is not important. Your eternal soul rests in your patience. Your soul that will live forever abides in your patience. It is important for God that he work patience into his children for this very reason. It's not an easy thing, I say again, to wait upon the Lord. There's a price to pay to have God's guidance and direction for your life. But it says in Psalm 1830, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. It is tried. We are to try it as we wait upon him. He is a buckler to all those that trust him. When you put your trust in the Lord, he will shield you in those tribulations. He will protect you in those tribulations. He will be your buckler as you trust in him and wait upon him. And as you do so, he will give direction for your life, perfect direction. Child of God, there will be times you will come to a crossroads in life and you simply don't know what direction to take. Or you're facing a problem and you simply don't know how to handle it. Life can be overwhelming at times. However, if you want God's direction, if you want God's answers to your problems, if you want God's direction, learn not to get ahead of God. Learn to patiently wait upon Him. People, children of God, can be robbed of so much in their life, spiritually, physically, and financially, because when they're unsure of what to do, they still just go ahead and do. Maybe they allow fear and distress to move in through the circumstances they face. And they feel by waiting, they're doing a disservice to themselves and God. That's not true. Maybe they allow people's opinions or the devil's mind battles to persuade them into action when they don't know what God's will is. 
and they get ahead of God. Maybe it's simply discontentment gets a hold of them as they wait. They're discontented. They want things to change and they want it to change now. Or simply, and this happens more often than not, people just want their own way. And in self-deceit, they label their will to be God's will. But when a person gets ahead of God, they're taking their life out of his hands. He's no longer in control to direct and guide them according to his will. I remember one time years ago in the beginning of my ministry, Reverend Angley gave me advice and I never forgot it. He said, son, the one thing you do not want to do ever do is to get ahead of God. Wait upon the Lord. And when you don't know what to do, you wait. And don't let man or devil or self persuade you to move until God moves. Because if you get ahead of God, he told me, you're probably going to make a mess. God may get a hold of you and bring you back in place. But you know what? The mess you made up the road, you're going to have to walk through it. As I said, there's a price to pay to patiently wait upon the Lord, to let him have his way of perfection in your life. However, there's a much greater price to pay when you don't wait upon the Lord and you get ahead of him. When you move ahead of God, you will suffer outside of his will. And there's no reward for such suffering. When a, you move and get ahead of God, you will suffer without his help because you have tied his hands in your life. You're outside of his will. And the suffering can be more severe and prolonged this way. And don't forget, when you get ahead of God, not only will you suffer, but there may be friends and loved ones who suffer as well because you decided to step out of God's will. Well, let's look to the Word of God now for examples of what it means to get ahead of God and what it means to stay in the will of God at all times, regardless of the price that must be paid. Abraham, a wonderful example of this. He was promised by God a son through Sarah, his wife, and through this son, a great nation would come forth. However, as time passed on, Abraham and Sarah begin to grow old, their bodies weak, Sarah knew what God had promised. However, looking at the circumstances, their weakness and old age, year after year passing by, no fulfillment of the promise, Sarah decides to take matters into her own hands by giving her handmaiden to Abraham to conceive a son. But this was not what God intended. Sarah's actions caused much grief and sorrow in the household of Abraham years later. Oh, getting ahead of God, the initial evidence of trouble may not be there. Sometimes when you get ahead of God, you don't pay the price till way down the road. And so it was for the household of Abraham. It wasn't until years later that a price was paid. Because when the child was born and began to grow up, Sarah grew jealous of the handmaid and her son. Eventually, the handmaid and her son were forced out of the camp to fend for themselves, a woman and a little boy, fending for themselves. And this left Abraham grieved at heart. He had to turn away his own son, his own flesh and blood, not knowing what would happen. There are repercussions to face when you don't wait upon God. And sometimes they can be very severe. I'm sure it broke Abraham's heart when he turned that little boy away. 
Never let circumstances dictate your actions. Never grow impatient with God and take matters into your own hands. God will let you do it, but there'll be repercussions. Wait upon God. Let his promises guide you. Look to him. Let his wisdom and knowledge give you understanding of what to do. Even if that wisdom and understanding is simply wait. Wait. For God is not ready to move yet. Wait. James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. What a powerful promise. What an unbelievable privilege that we could actually ask God for wisdom, and he'd give it liberally. Now let's go to Rebecca, the wife of Isaac. At one time, Rebecca lived very close to God. For when she was pregnant with twins, the Lord told her that the younger twin, Jacob, in the future would rule the older twin, Esau. So as the children grew up, Jacob becomes Rebecca's favorite son, the center of her life. Then when Isaac is growing old and it appears that he's coming to the end of life's journey, he decides now is the time to pronounce the family blessing upon the eldest son, Esau. Well, by now, Rebecca's love for Jacob, who is the center of her life, has far outgrown her love for God. So, so desiring that this blessing be placed upon Jacob instead of Esau, instead of putting her trust in the promise that God made her years ago, instead of patiently waiting upon the Lord for the fulfillment of the promise, Rebecca grows impatient. And what happens in her impatience? She forgets the promise of God, and in her desperation, she turns to deceit. She turns to sin. Rebecca devised a plan with Jacob to deceive Isaac into blessing Jacob instead of Esau. And then when the eldest son Esau finds out, the family is broken up forever. Esau wants to kill his brother Jacob, which forces Jacob to flee into another country. And Jacob will never see his mother again. His mother who loved him so much, the center of her life would never lay eyes on Jacob again. For she would die before Jacob returns to his homeland. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good. Sounds great, but there's conditions. All things work together for good for who? To them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Do you love God? Are you in his divine will? When you love the Lord with first love, nothing less, first love, then you will trust him. And you will patiently wait upon him, regardless of the circumstances you face. And he will try and test that love and that faith and that obedience. And even when you don't understand what is going on around you, and it does not appear that God is going to move, by faith, you know God is faithful to his promises. And in his will, as you walk in his will, everything will work out for good. It's the word of God and he cannot lie. Rebecca lost her first love for God by putting Jacob before God. Jacob was at the center of her life, not God. Her love for Jacob caused her to forget God's promise 
and turn to deceit to get what she wanted for her son. And the family was destroyed forever. God called Moses to lead Israel out of Egyptian's bondage to the land of Canaan, God's promised land. It took God many years to prepare Moses for this great task. Now in Egypt, God is using Moses. Plague after plague after plague is raining down upon the Egyptians. Finally, Pharaoh is ready to turn loose of Israel. After 400 years of slavery, now God is leading the Israelites, leading them out of Egypt, into the wilderness, up to the bank of the Red Sea. Now Pharaoh decides to come after them. He has a change of heart. So he comes down upon them with his great army. It appears Israel's trapped, set up to be destroyed. Pharaoh's army on one side, the Red Sea on the other side. To the Israelites, this looks to be one big mistake. But Israel did not trust God. How quickly Israel forgot what just happened in Egypt. Those mighty, powerful plagues that rained down one after another after another, bringing Pharaoh to his knees, the greatest, most powerful man on earth, to his knees. Now Israel's ready to surrender and go back into slavery. After 400 years of bondage, just that quick. But Moses saw things differently, for he had been prepared by God, and Moses had a different mindset than the Israelites. And Moses proclaimed to the people, what? Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Stand still, not just physically. Stand still in your mind. Stand still looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Stand still with your mind on the promises of God. Friend, I hope you're enjoying this sermon today and stay tuned. We have more of the sermon coming up later in the program. But first, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you partners out there who are standing by Reverend Angeline in this Jesus ministry with your tithes and your love offerings. You're helping us to continue to take the gospel of Jesus Christ all over the world in so many different ways. World radio, the internet, social media, the printed page, our Growing in Grace mission program, on and on it goes. Even this television program and our live stream services that are reaching people all over the world. Friend, thank you for standing by. Thank you for supporting God's work. And the Word of God says when you tithe and give unto His work, the Lord would open up the windows of heaven upon your life and bless you spiritually, physically, and financially in all three ways. It's not just financial blessings. No, the Lord goes above and beyond. So give. And if you're watching today, you're not a partner or a member of Grace Cathedral, I encourage you to pay your tithes, give your love offerings, and see what God will do for you. See how he'll bless you as you help us win souls. You can donate through our website at ernestangeley.org, or you can send in your donation by mail. Write to Ernest Angeley Ministries, P.O. Box 1790, Akron, Ohio, 44309. You watching in Canada, write to Ernest Angeley Ministries, P.O. Box 970, Station U, Toronto, Ontario, M8Z5P9. And each month that you sponsor, you will get a letter of the month. And the letter we'll send to you in April is entitled, The First Easter, a blessed message by Reverend Angeley to you. And each month that you sponsor this worldwide ministry, you'll get a new book of the month. And this month of April, being Easter, we will send you two classics by Reverend Angeley instead of just one. 
And the first is entitled, The Soul Feeds the Mind. The second, The Soul is the Reservoir for the Mind. These are wonderful teachings about your soul and your mind and how to keep them protected in the Lord. Well, now we have more good music and singing, but first it's the orchestra with Beautiful Easter. you were blessed by that song. Now, taking you back to Grace Cathedral for more of the sermon, What to Do When You Don't Know What to Do. And friend, there are times in life that we come to this place and we must look to the Lord for His direction. Listen and be blessed. In the divine will of God, your responsibility is to stand still in His love and in His faith waiting upon him until he provides you a path of deliverance. That's what God did for Moses and the Israelites. He made a way where there was no way by parting the Red Sea, a highway of deliverance that turned into a death trap for Pharaoh's army. In the divine will of God, again I say, your love, your faith, your obedience will be tried again and again and again. 
But remember, God is in control. So never try to make your own way of escape. Wait upon the Lord. Standing upon his promises until he parts your Red Sea. Wait upon the Lord until God makes a way for you where there is no way. The story of Lazarus is a, a very good lesson of trust and patience in God. Lazarus, a close friend of Jesus that he loved so very much, became sick. So Lazarus' sister sent word to Jesus that he may come and minister to Lazarus and heal him and make him well. Well, upon receiving this message, Jesus does something strange. He tarries in that same place two more days. Again, in the natural, this seems negligent. This seems careless, almost heartless. For we all know Jesus has the power to heal and deliver at any given moment, but he delays. Finally, he makes his way to Lazarus' home. And when he does, Lazarus has been dead for four days. In the natural, it appears Jesus arrived too late, that he had failed his friend in his friend's greatest hour of need. However, the loved ones of Lazarus did not understand that God was in control and his plan was about to unfold before them. John chapter 11, verses 4 and 11. When Jesus heard that, meaning receiving the news that Lazarus was sick, when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. These things said he, and after that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may wake him out of sleep. Lazarus' sickness and passing was going to bring glory to God and glorify the Son of God. And here in this passage, Jesus refers to death as sleep. God is not a man. God does not think like a man. And to God, death is just like sleep. Just like sleep. Because the power of God can bring someone out of death as simple as you waking up your loved one out of sleep. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. From a human standpoint, Jesus appeared to be four days late. But with God, Jesus was right on time. John chapter 11, verses 43 and 40 through 45. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto them, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed upon him. Souls were added to the kingdom by this trial and test. When you walk in the divine will of God, and you come to the place you don't know what to do, you patiently wait with your trust in God. The Apostle Paul is a great example for us today. He learned to wait upon the Lord, never getting ahead of God. Now, as a result, Paul suffered, and he suffered much. But no one in the early church was more like Jesus or did a greater work than Paul. And listen to what Paul wrote to the Philippians. Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. This right here is what it means to wait upon the Lord. 
This is a mouthful. Let me repeat that. For I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Just because things are not going your way or everything around you looks bad, that doesn't mean you have failed God or God is failing you. Paul was content in all his circumstances, and he faced many extreme circumstances. But he always knew he was in God's will, and all that he had to endure, it would work out for good eventually. Whether it was his good, God's good, or for the good of souls, or all three. But good would always be worked out. Child of God, when you don't know what to do, don't move. Do not move until you receive divine direction. Wait upon the Lord. In John's gospel, Jesus instructed his followers of the necessity of receiving the person of the Holy Ghost into their life through the baptism, instructing them that the Holy Ghost would be their teacher and he would guide them into all truth. The Holy Ghost will keep a person on the narrow way of life, leading and guiding them in God's will. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21. And thine ear shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it. When ye turn to the right hand, and when ye turn to the left. Revelation chapter 3, verse 22. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Sometimes walking the narrow way, it can grow so dark, so very dark, that within yourself, you cannot see ahead of you. You don't know what to do or how to act. This is when you lean on your guide, the Holy Spirit, in a greater way than ever. Let him use the word to lighten your path with understanding and show you the way, show you God's way. Psalm 119, 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The spirit of truth will use the truth to give you direction, guidance. But you must feel the need. You must trust the word and the Holy Ghost and you must wait until, until he delivers it to you. So many people miss out because when problems arise, troubles present themselves, and certain critical decisions need to be made, to which maybe they don't have the obvious answer or solution. The initial reaction, again, is to just, even if they're unsure, reach out to people, asking for their opinion, looking to within self and what self would do and wants to do, instead of waiting upon the Lord and trusting Him for direction. Still others in the world when they don't know what to do, they never look to God because they simply don't want anyone, even God, to tell them what to do. Many people, they want to live their life doing as they please. And God will allow it because we are free moral agents. However, if you live your life with this mentality, sooner or later there will be repercussions as I said earlier, there will be consequences. For an example, in the 12th chapter of Luke's gospel, here Jesus spoke of a rich man who brought in a great harvest, so much so that he had no room for that mighty bounty. Faced with this problem, important decisions needed to be made. And Jesus said that this man asked himself, what shall I do? 
He didn't ask God. He looked within himself. What shall I do? The rich man did not inquire of God concerning this situation. Had he looked to God, what do you think the Lord maybe would have told him? How would the Lord have directed him? Well, I dare say, first of all, the Lord would have instructed him, reminded him to give thanks for that great bounty, for that mighty harvest, because a farmer can only do so much, but a farmer cannot give life to the earth that it produce. Surely the Lord would have instructed him to pay tithes and give love on this mighty bounty. Maybe pay debts. People that he owed. Or maybe to simply take of this bounty and give to those who are in great need. Instead, the rich man looked to himself and declared, I will tear down my barns. I will build greater barns. I will say to my soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. The rich man believed this to be a wise and prudent plan. However, God thought otherwise. Luke 12, 20. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? God called the rich man a fool for a variety of reasons. Foolish for not looking to God about what to do. Foolish for not dividing with God in ties and love. Foolish for thinking he could find spiritual satisfaction in the things of the world. Foolish for being so selfish with that which God had blessed him with. Soul, take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. What foolish thinking. Luke 12, 21. Jesus said, So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. Friend, listening to this sermon, what do you value most in life? What do you treasure? By knowing the answers to these questions, a person can learn a lot about themselves. Jesus said, where a person's treasure is, that is where their heart is. So I ask you, what is your treasure? Is your treasure simply doing as you please and not seeking guidance and direction from the Lord and his word? Is your treasure satisfying the lusts of the flesh and enjoying the pleasures of sin? Is your treasure fellowship with the world, the people and the things of the world? Is your treasure the wealth and riches of this world? These treasures that I just mentioned, they're all temporal. They do not last. All of these treasures will erode and fade away. And these treasures will leave your eternal soul corrupt and barren when you enter into eternity. Now, people that Jesus said are rich towards God, people that are rich towards God, they treasure God's guidance and direction for their life. People that are rich towards God, they treasure truth and the promises of God. They treasure the divine blood and the Holy Ghost. They treasure the nine fruits of the Holy Spirit. They treasure God's holiness and God's righteousness. They treasure mercy, forgiveness, and compassion. They treasure the divine grace of God, which provides strength, divine strength in their human weakness. Friend, are you rich towards God? What do you treasure? Such treasures as these will make your soul satisfied and full of life when you enter into eternity one day. Friend, where your treasure is, that is where your heart is. 
And at this time, I want to pray with you. You here in this auditorium, you here watching this live stream. Where is your treasure? Examine your life, whether you be in the faith or not. Do you treasure the things of the world, self, sin, that which is unlike God? If so, there's power in the blood, friend, to change you. There's power in the blood to deliver you and set you free from all sin, all unrighteousness and ungodliness. Say this prayer with me tonight. You need the blood, friend. You need the divine blood upon your soul that will set you free and deliver you and give you eternal life. And through the blood, you can be made rich towards God. Say, O oh God, save my soul. Forgive me of my sins. I'm so sorry that I have sinned against you. But I have come home to serve you the rest of my life. And I believe there is power in the divine blood of Jesus, power that washes away all of my sin. Say, come into my heart, Jesus. Come into my heart, dear Jesus. Friend, if you meant that prayer, Jesus is yours. That means you have the healer living within you. The power in the divine blood that washed away your sins and gave you eternal life in your soul is the same power that will heal you of every sickness and every disease in your body. The Bible says the prayer of faith would save the sick and the Lord would raise him up. The Bible says a believer would lay hands on the sick and they would recover. And friend, I'm the Lord's believer. And many of you, you put in your request tonight, whether it's for yourself or a loved one. Now, receive from the Lord what it is you need. We will agree together along with all of these people here in this congregation for God to meet your need. Put your hand against mine on the screen as a form of laying on of hands and believe the Lord to move for you now. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I bring those who are sick in body, those who are in great need, lay a healing hand upon each one. In the holy blood name of Jesus, heal, heal, heal. Move for them, deliver them and set them free. Lord, for your honor and glory, by the power in the blood of your son Jesus, we give you all the praise and the glory in the name of Jesus. And friend, watch every sign of improvement and give God the honor, the praise, and the glory. And let us know what God has done for you. And now it's time to receive the Holy Ghost. You need that power from on high. You need the person of the Holy Ghost living within you to lead you, to guide you all the way to rapture ground, to teach you what it means to trust upon the Lord and wait upon him. Oh, what a teacher he is. And he will be that and so much more in your life. It is the gift of the Holy Ghost, a gift provided by God through the power and the blood of Jesus. And that gift can be yours. And I want everyone here in this auditorium to stand to your feet tonight. I'm going to call this anointing down upon you, friend. And you can receive the Holy Ghost. Whatever it is you need, the Holy Ghost can move for you. And he'll anoint you. And as I call this anointing down, friend, begin to praise the Lord. Praise him with your whole heart, glorifying him. One glory after another. Let the glories roll from a heart of love and gratitude with your mind centered on Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for you. Let that blood do a perfect work. Let the Holy Ghost come in. Yield yourself completely to the Holy Ghost, friend. And as you glorify him with your tongue, the power of the Holy Ghost will rest upon you. And when that power rests upon you, the person of the Holy Ghost, he will come in as you yield yourself. And when he comes in, 
that language will change. Your glories will change into another language, a heavenly language, and this will signify that the Holy Ghost has baptized you, set up his abode within you. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I bring this people before you. Receive ye the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus. Receive ye the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus. Oh, friend, I hope you were blessed by the sermon today. And those of you who were looking to the Lord for prayer, just keep watching and expecting results and give God honor, praise, and glory for what he has done for you. And friend, if you have received healings, miracles, blessings through this Jesus ministry, we would love to hear about it. Let your Jesus light shine. And one great way to do that is send us your testimony. You can send it by email to testimonies at ernestangeley.org. Or you can mail in your testimony, write to Ernest Angeley Ministries, P.O. Box 1790, Akron, Ohio, 44309. Friend, I want to encourage you, when you have the opportunity, please pay us a visit at Grace Cathedral. We would welcome you with open arms. Visitors are always welcome to worship the Lord with us. We have the Friday night service at 7 p.m. with good music and singing. Also, the Word of God being preached. And if you're in need of prayer, just ask an usher, and they will assist you in receiving prayer at the end of the sermon. Then Sunday at 10 a.m. and at 7 p.m., two services that will greatly bless you with more good music and singing and preaching of God's Word and prayer for those who are in need. And friend, I want to encourage you to check out all of our social media pages. We add new content each and every week. Follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, and do become a subscriber to our YouTube channel at Ernest Angley Ministries. And when you subscribe, hit the notification bell. By doing that, you will be notified every time we put up new content You'll also be notified when the online service is about to start. Well, friend, we have something very special for you next week on the Ernest Angley Hour. We are taking you back in time to a crusade Reverend Angley conducted in Nairobi, Kenya in 1988. You will be greatly blessed by the man of God ministering to the people in word and in praying for them. So we look forward to seeing you next week.